district manager, but um, due to my experience in working in the watershed program, I decided I was touted as the one to do this presentation here today, which I'm happy to do. Uh, probably be my first and last time that I do a presentation here today, so I hope I don't blow it. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. So, yeah, the topic of my presentation today is um, strategies that the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation uh, has embarked upon or has been doing to reduce phosphorus and sediment loads on forest land and forestry operations. We really don't, well, I have a few slides that I'm going to use as sort of like an introductory uh, to kind of like lay the, the, the background, the framework before I actually get into the strategies. I should mention that some of these strategies that I'll be talking about today are broad-based, fairly general, uh, don't really have the time within 15 minutes to get down to really dig deep, deep into the weeds, but I'll be providing you uh, some links for more information if you so desire to, to do so. It really turns out that we don't really know a lot about, uh, about phosphorus and phosphorus content from forest land. Um, there's really very little data available in Vermont or even region-wide for that matter. Uh, I've looked into it, haven't really found too much at all. Uh, the little bit that we do know is that there's very, like I said, there's very little data on pea content, phosphorus content from forest land uh, in Vermont. Um, it averages around 600 milligrams per kilogram. Um, ag soils can run much higher than that, two to three times much more uh, than the forest land. So knowing that, you know, yeah, you might ask the question, what's the big deal? Well, what is the big deal? Well, the fact is, you know, the EPA, the KMDF, the Lake Champlain, um, addresses forest land, and through the SWAT modeling, uh, the source water and air tool that uh, uh, that EPA used, they determined that 16% of the total phosphorus that's going into Lake Champlain has been attributed to forest land. Um, that 16% um, includes both you know, background conditions as well as uh, forest man phosphorus inputs from uh, forest management activities, i.e. logging, building roads, skid trails, uh, log landings. Uh, that means that it really amounts to 16% uh, is a small amount per unit area, but when you look at the fact that 66% of the Lake Champlain Basin is forested, and, um, that means that um, cumulatively it does matter. Um, and so forest management is an area of concern, uh, something that we need to focus our attention on. And um, statewide, we're looking at of course, you know, much of Lake Champlain Basin is dominated by ag, but if you look at Vermont as a whole, we're at 75% forest. So where does the phosphorus, how does it get into the water? Um, I think you remember with, with forestry, with forestry operations, sediment is, is the culprit. Uh, whenever you have, you know, logging operations, forest management activities require the construction of forest roads, log landings, uh, skid trails. Uh, those are areas that can get compacted, um, and anytime you have, you know, bare mineral soil, there's always the potential for soil to move. And if, if AMPs or BMPs are not in place, uh, there is the potential that, you know, sedimentation could occur if water bodies are nearby. We do know that there's a high percentage of the total phosphorus loss, or loss is associated with sediment, you know, particulate sediment. <clears throat> so therefore, it would seem you know, reasonable that reducing sediment will reduce you know, phosphorus input. And that's sort of the premise that, that we're using uh, moving forward in addressing phosphorus, particulate phosphorus, which we do have control over uh, from forestry operations. So let's, let's get into the strategies. One strategy that we're continuing to uh, employ, and this is uh, not just uh, specific to the Lake Champlain Basin, but statewide is the EMPs, uh, the acceptable management practices for maintaining water quality and logging operations. The EMPs are designed to prevent discharges of uh, sediment, uh, logging slash or any other hazardous materials from entering water to the state. 
Uh, they become, they were, uh, have been effective since 1987. Uh, during the course of the last four years, I was pretty heavily engaged in rewriting, updating those AMPs. Uh, a lot of the states had to develop, all the states developed AMPs as a result of, or BMPs as a result of uh, amendments to the Clean Water Act, uh, which needed us to address, you know, uh, non-point pollution on silvicultural operations. Uh, many of the states had updated their BMPs, uh, it was time for them to do the same. Uh, Act 64 of 2015 actually made it mandatory uh, for us to do that. Uh, we were told by the legislature that we will update the EMPs by, by rule. Uh, and it's just uh, happy to announce that they're just finally uh, finalized through, uh, went through rulemaking. So these are the key highlights of the EMP revision. Um, First one is they, we require uh, compliance with the ANR stream alteration uh, rule and general permit. Basically, what that means is that any permanent structure which might uh, occur on probably a truck road uh, would have to meet those uh, stream alteration uh, standards. And that would be on a perennial stream. We have news. I work pretty closely with. Uh, DC watershed folks, the stream alteration engineers, and coming up with uh, um, new standards for sizing temporary stream crossings. Those are stream crossings structures that are used just during the course of the logging operation itself and have to be removed uh, prior to when the operation is completed. We have a new AMP that addresses hazardous materials, even though uh, right in the little orange book, which some of you might be familiar with and have seen, um, it mentions right up front that petroleum products or other hazardous materials are considered uh, you know, a discharge if they get into state waters, yet we didn't have an AMP that specifically addressed that, and we do now. Enhanced stream buffer protection. We're uh, in the old, in the orange book. We're asking for 25 feet uh, anytime soil was exposed within 25 feet of a stream that had to be seeded or mulched. Uh, we're extending that now to 50 feet. Uh, that's a very low cost um, um, application or measure uh, that we're asking for, but you know would would uh, you know get huge dividends from as far as water resource protection goes. We're strengthening the standards to better manage ditch wire on our ditch rails and, and, uh, and truck roads, and we're specifically talking about the approaches to those um, stream crossings. Uh, we found through uh, previous uh, water quality AMP audits and through our AMP monitoring program that when we do have uh, discharges associated with logging operations, they're very much oftentimes associated with stream crossings, specifically those that are located on, on, on skid trails. So we really need to tighten up. We made an effort through the AMP revision to try to tighten up those standards uh, with that. We have uh, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Um, is about um, the one that I'm going to talk that I'm talking about here today. There's a, a number of them now. Uh, this was a um, a grant that ANR and the Agency of Ag put in about three years ago um, to NRCS to get uh, help improve water quality in the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, we were awarded a $16 million grant that goes over the course of five years. I believe we're getting into year three on this grant right now. A portion of this grant is dedicated to uh, uh, addressing uh, practices for landowners to improve water quality, forestry practices. And those practices include uh, seeding and mulching, um, stabilizing skid trails, uh, riparian plantings, and also uh, improving stream crossing structures, uh, permanent stream crossing structures. Uh, up in the left hand corner of, your, of the screen here, there's a picture of a, a new lightweight timber bridge that we recently installed on a private property over in, outside of Richmond. We're finding this is a practice that all these practices have been funded you know, previously through EQIP. RCCP, RCPP offers a separate funding pool uh, 
that utilizes those uh, input practices that NRCS offers, cost share practices for the landowners. We're finding uh, the, the stream crossing practice um, using the lightweight timber bridges uh, is something that has you know, been used in ag quite a bit over the years in the past, but has never seen forestry applications. And we're utilizing that practice for forestry because it does qualify. And we're finding a huge need out there to um, address that issue. There's a huge need for improving these stream crossing structures. Now, the Portable Skidder Bridge Initiative is an initiative that I started about 10 years ago uh, with the help of many partners. Um, we've had several programs uh, just specifically aimed at the Lake Champlain Basin, uh, starting out with what we call the Free Loan and Education Program. That was basically designed to expose loggers to this new technology. Um, portable scooter bridges really haven't been around all that long. They started showing up on the scene uh, back in the 1990s down in Massachusetts and were being used and are being used in the Pasco watershed for the New York City water supply. Um, we've had uh, cost year programs, which are, was a statewide program. We got a lot of uh, bloggers signed up to uh, build those programs. Those are both uh, grant funded programs that have, um, have, gone by, have fallen by the wayside now. Hopefully, we can maybe get some, find some grants to start them up again because they, they were both very successful programs and uh, something that was uh, a good thing to do. We do have also a third program called the uh, Portable Scooter Bridge Rental Program. That program is administered by the Natural Resource Conservation Districts. Uh, we have, I believe, 14 districts in Vermont, and most of them are providing that, that uh, rental program. Uh, that's proven to be a pretty successful program. We're getting steady um, demand from loggers every year to, to use these bridges. Um, the bridges are staged at uh, sawmills and log yards. Uh, the district managers work closely with um, the, those log yard owners and making sure that you know the bridges are, are, are they go out uh, are, are return and that the loggers have the information up front where they know how you know, the bridges should be used uh, successfully to uh, protect the water quality. Um, can't stress enough um, the value of education and outreach, and that's been um, that's one of our strategies. Has been, will be, and continue to be uh, as we move forward. We work for some parts works closely with uh, Logger Education to Advance Professionalism Program, and we support uh, their efforts. We've done a number of workshops uh, on water quality AMP training for loggers um, since this program has been around, dating back to. Um, the, the early 1990s. And Forest and Parks in itself, and we'll continue to host workshops on our own. Some new projects, uh, future initiatives that I want to touch upon. Um, one of them is uh, we have a current project underway, um, LIDAR mapping of forest legacy roads. Um, that's that's a two-year grant-funded project uh, through NRCS uh, with a focus on the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab has teamed up with Bear Creek Environmental to take this project on. What we're trying to do is uh, we're looking into investigating the feasibility of using LIDAR to map these forest legacy roads. And, you know, these are like the the, unforg the forgotten, unnoticed roads that are all too common out there in Vermont's landscape. Um, some of them have probably been around for, you know, they could have been in place for many years, you know, maybe even decades, dating back to even when, you know, machinery, forest machinery first started entering the forest. But these roads really... Um, do contribute uh, water quality to water quality impairment. Uh, we're trying to investigate, and hopefully, we'll be successful in seeing how lidar can be used as a tool for identifying uh, those roads on our on our landscape. We're hoping that that the project proves successful because just knowing the uh, just knowing the amount and extent. Of forest roads within a watershed is really a gauge to determining what the potential watershed you know, health could be. 
Another, um, sort of moving into the future here, I think that you know, technology sometimes is um, underrated, maybe overrated, but technology is part of the answer too. And we have a program up in Maine that started a few years ago that provided incentive financing to reduce uh, non-point pollution, uh, uh, source pollution risk. And this is something that we're hoping that we can get uh, established here in Vermont, but that program in itself is, utilizes funding from uh, the state revolving clean water fund to address uh, non-point solution and encourage BMP implement, implementation on, on logging operations. Our keeping forests and forests is part of the answer to and one of our strategies that uh, we'll continue to employ moving forward. Um, this is our mantra, this is our mission, forests and parks. And, uh, you know, we have programs like UVA, Forest Legacy, that contribute to keeping forested, for, forest forested. Uh, we can't overlook the role that land trusts and public lands play in this as well. I have two more slides. <laughs> I've run over my time getting the queue here. But I'll, I'll briefly touch upon this. We also have um, the healthy forest cover strategies, and this is part of the Lake Champlain implementation um, plan. Uh, I'm just going to go through them really quick here. Um, we know that maintaining and enhancing forest cover is part of the answer to, you know, to providing water quality. Um, certain studies and research in the past have shown that once you, if you go below that 65% threshold in the watershed, you're going to start seeing water quality impairments. Uh, we're restoring, we want to restore buffers, riparian buffers. We want to enhance urban forest cover. Um, the new stormwater regs uh, that are coming out provides credits for reforestation and tree planting, uh, uh, which is great news for us. Preparing for the mitigating impacts from these potential threats, the emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, Asian lung horn beetle, and the forest adaptation and climate change. The, this great publication that Sandy Wilmot put out is all part of our for healthy forest cover strategies. We have 13 separate actions that support these strategies that I'll not have time to get into here today. And last but not least, I just wanted to mention uh, Act 171 of 2016. Um, part of that act um, it addresses forest fragmentation, keeping our you know, uh, forest blocks together, encouraging giving authority to RPCs and municipalities to plan to keep these large forest blocks in place, which will all help contribute to uh, water quality. And these are just a couple, if you, you know, wanted to dig down a little bit deeper uh, into this and learn more, uh, you can find information on our website as well as the DC website for the Lake Champlain PMDL.